We're going to give you something even faster. We're going to give you one of these. <laughs> it's a supercomputer. You laugh. You say, well, why do mere mortals need a supercomputer? <laughs> what are you talking about? Steve's gone loopy. Well, it turns out you actually need one now because Photoshop filters are now resembling the most sophisticated image processing that NASA does. Internet security is demanding CIA strength algorithms. And encoding digital media is something that used to happen quickly. Now you might as well go out to lunch while it's happening. And these kinds of tasks now are really slowing us down. These kinds of tasks are basically bringing today's personal computers to their knees. And yet they're precisely what supercomputers were invented to do really fast. Precisely. And we're doing them every day now, only we're not doing them really fast. So what is it that makes a supercomputer super? What precisely is it? It's this. A supercomputer can execute over one billion floating point operations per second. A billion. That's a lot. It's a staggering measure of performance that's known as a gigaflop. Giga as in billion, flop as in floating point operation. A billion floating point operations per second. Now, let me give you some examples of why you might need that. Take a Photoshop filter on a 2K by 2K image, okay? You got 4 million pixels on the image. A very simple Photoshop filter is going to take you 400 operations per pixel. It could be many times that. That's 1.6 gigaflops to do that operation in one second. You might have 10 filters you want to run on that image, and you might have 30 images you need to run it on four times a week. You can see how this adds up. Quick time encoding. We got 30 frames per second. A 640 by 480 image is 300,000 pixels per frame. We've got 200 operations per pixel to encode it. That's 1.8 gigaflops to do this in real time. This is the kind of stuff we want to do. This is the kind of stuff we are doing, except we're doing it slowly. So we think gigaflops are going to become a very popular thing in the near future. And this is how to get them. Who can afford their very own supercomputer? Right? How many of you have a supercomputer? Not many. But that's all going to change, because today, we're announcing the new PowerPC G4 chip. This thing is incredible. It's the first supercomputer on a chip. It delivers a sustained performance. Well, before I get to that, actually, it has been architected by Apple, Motorola, and IBM. And it delivers a sustained performance of over one gigaflops. Sustained. And it has a peak performance of four gigaflops. It's unbelievable. And we think this thing is going to set the industry on fire. So what makes it so fast? Well, if you look at a traditional processor, oh, it's something we call the velocity engine. The velocity engine is a supercomputer that's been miniaturized onto a sliver of silicon and is a part of every G4 processor chip. Right? The velocity engine. And what is that? Well, if you look at a traditional processor, you've, the high end, you've got three types of instruction units. One that calculates branches, one that does integer arithmetic, and one that does floating point arithmetic. The G4 adds a fourth called the velocity engine but it's unlike any of the first three. The first three are 32 bits, or in some cases 64 bits of information at once. The velocity engine's a 128-bit instruction unit, right? So this thing processes two to four times the amount of data at once as traditional processors do. But the most amazing thing is this thing can do four 32-bit floating point operations in one cycle. That's two to four times faster than anything our industry has ever seen before. And so what does that mean? Well, if you're doing four instructions per cycle and you're running at 500 million cycles per second, which is what megahertz means, 
That's two gigaflops. Now, the velocity engine, in some cases, can actually do eight instructions in one cycle to get to the theoretical peak of four gigaflops. We've never seen this in a single piece of silicon before, the G4. Now, how does this stack up against Intel's brand new third generation processor, their Pentium 3? Well, we thought one of the best ways to measure it would be to go ask Intel. And so we did. We went to their website. And what we found was that Intel had written some tests for the Pentium 3 and published them right on their website. And we were able to run those exact same tests, Intel's very own tests on the G4. And let me show you the results. The G4 was 2.9 times faster than the Pentium 3 running Intel's own tests. That's what we're talking about here. So we're very excited about this. Now, this high velocity chip deserves a high velocity computer. And so we're going to be shipping the G4 in 400, 450 and 500 megahertz versions. All have a one megabyte L2 cache. And there'll be a few different models. The high end models will also include some other features like three times the memory bandwidth over the G3s. Now what does that mean? What that means is the processor can exchange information with the memory three times faster. And that's key when you're dealing in certain types of graphic operations. It's key when you're dealing in anything where that processor's got to manipulate memory and put it back. Very important. 3x the memory bandwidth. Twice the PCI bus throughput compared to the G3. RAGE 128 graphics on AGP2X bus much faster graphics with 16 megabytes of graphics memory. Ultra ATA 66 drives, so you can burst information twice as fast from the drives as you could on the G3. And all of the models have FireWire built in. FireWire, we think, is incredibly important. It runs at 400 megabits per second, and it's an industry standard. Every, consu every major consumer and computer electronics company is supporting it. And we're very excited. The number of devices is now starting to take off exactly like USB did six months ago. There are over 60 announced devices and we're just about to cross the threshold with 25 of them shipping. And you'll see these things really take off in the next three to six months as well. And this is not even counting consumer electronics devices because there are over seven million camcorders in the world that already have firewire jacks on them every digital camcorder. And this is very important to us because we really believe in desktop video. And now you can get video into your computer without any extra add-on cards in pristine digital quality using FireWire right off these digital cameras that sell for under $1,000. There's also hard drives and even in this case zip drives now with FireWire interfaces on them. They derive their power right from FireWire so you can just plug in a little four, six gig, eight gig drive and use it as removable storage. Some of the best digital cameras in the world now feature FireWire ports built in to transfer the voluminous amount of data you get from image sensors that are now 2K by 2K. Scanners, even magneto optical drives, there's a bunch of stuff in the Apple booth today I'd suggest you go check it out. We think FireWire is going to be extremely important and it's built into every single G4. And airports. Our wireless networking is built into the high-end models of the G4s, so you can just pop that same airport card right in and put your G4 on the airport network and even use it as a software base station so that you don't even have to buy a hardware base station. So that's the G4, and I'd like to now show you what it looks like. You know what the G3 looks like. Let me show you what the G4 looks like. This is it right here. It's beautiful. 